says, whose or what is Mystery Babylon? So this is referring to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 17, verse 5. It says, and we were speaking actually about this earlier where the Bible is talking about this woman. Let's back up to verse uh, verse 1 of chapter 17. It says, And one of the seven angels who had seven bowls came and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her, of her fornic fornication. And so John's then taken away to the wilderness. Uh, boy, I could go on and talk about the significance of the wilderness. And he sees this woman sitting on a scarlet beast. And it says, uh, beast which was full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and seven, and sorry, and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cu cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And then on her forehead, forehead, a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So it says written on her forehead was a name. And then this is her name, Mystery Babylon the Great, mother of harlots. In the Bible, the name always tells you about a person, or I should say always, but almost always, to a crazy degree uh, of frequency, the name is telling you about a person. So when we talk about the mm -hmm. name of God, people obsess with the name of God, but there's no a name of God. There's so much to God, so many aspects of his character, personality, that there are multiple, tons and tons of names of God. Mm -hmm. And in this case now, this too is not giving us the literal name of this person. Oh, this is what we're going to call them. This is telling us about their character. So like they're the mother of harlots. And we heard it again and again, right? This is a harlot, a harlot, a harlot. So what do harlots do? They they engage in fornication. They engage in non-marital sex. They're sleeping around with people. And when God is using it to describe a woman, he, he's often describing like you go back to Jeremiah, especially, and I think Ezekiel and the other prophets, uh, Hosea, Hosea, God had Hosea marry a, marry a prostitute, and then she cheated on him, and God used this as an, a living example of his experience with the, the children of Israel mm -hmm. and, 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 and Judah. So as we were talking about earlier, this is about, now we're talking about the future or more present of a a force within christianity maybe not a force but a body within christianity who is cheating on god and one way to cheat is with with idolatry idolatry is usually very much associated with cheating on god <clears throat> but uh, it it can be even just putting other gods before god they're serving some other master uh, maybe it's even themselves and then the mystery itself what does that mean uh could there be elements within Christianity that get into being like a mystery religion where they love having these secrets and esotericism and you have a, a big gap between the laity and the clergy class who the clergy class get entered into these mysteries and these secrets and the higher up you go, the more you learn and um, very opaque, opaque, occultish in a sense. Uh, that is getting at so that that i think there's a mystery of iniqu iniquity right tina that's referred to in elsewhere yes. in the bible too yeah the mystery of iniquity mm -hmm. exactly basically why did satan rebel against god you know the mystery of iniquity is my understanding let me um, quickly find that verse because i think that's an important one that connects here there aren't that many verses that use mystery so 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, yeah, it says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now lets will let until he is taken out of the way. So Paul was talking about how in his time, the the what many refer to as the Antichrist hadn't yet come, 
they're still waiting. And he said, there's something that's keeping this corruptive force, this corruptive institution from coming. Uh, and if you look at early Christian writings, they explain that Paul was telling people, basically, the Roman Empire, the civil Roman Empire is what was keeping this from creeping in and, and taking over. And once the Roman power was taken away, then we see emerging out uh, in this area, in fact, in Rome, this wickedness, this hmm. mystery of iniquity. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to add more, more flesh? I on mean, this? I guess like, I can't help but think of, you know, when it's talking about mystery to um, second Peter chapter one twenty. you know, Peter says something really interesting here. Um, you know, talking about prophecy in the Bible. And I feel like that is a big thing within Christianity is, um, you know, where Satan has worked to, you know, tear down um, God's church is just kind of trying to bring in doctrines and philosophies and things, you know, that are, you know, like, oh, you have to have this or know this to know God or, you know, and, and that's, you don't need um, you, you just need God. Like you can just go to the Bible and go to the Lord yourself and, you know, and, and know him as your personal savior. Um, and second Peter two, uh, basically in starting verse from 19 says, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts, which is Jesus. And verse 20 says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so I feel like there's a lot of things in this world where they're trying to add to the Bible. They're trying to take away from the Bible. And um, and both of those are, you know, ditches on either side of the straight and narrow road that's going to lead you to heaven. And so I, I feel like that's part of this, you know, this mystery is, you know, just um, it's like you know, where did this come from? We're like, this isn't part of the word of God. And, you know, God wants to make his word clear and known. So yeah, I so think that it's part of, you know, this, this system of false worship. It's either adding or taking away from the word of God. And again, Isaiah 8, 20, you know, if it speaks not according to this word is because there's no light in it. So yeah, I like your word of the, the use of the word system. I keep wanting to say force, but I'm, I need a better word. System is a good way of, of describing it. So yeah, is there a system? If you look back, especially through history, so after the fall of Rome, so maybe let's say around 300-ish, 80, do you see a system emerging within Christianity, which is um, more about the rituals and the mystery and, and these uh, creating a, a mystical sort of experience as opposed to just sticking with the Bible, what the Bible says, and, and being all for the pure truth, and in the simple, humble, primitive Christianity that we see Jesus and the early church uh, living out. And when when you start looking at that, and you start looking at then, okay, yeah, this grandiose, mysterious sort of religion that emerges around three hundred. Uh, AD and becomes really popularized and becomes institutionalized in Christianity. And you see lots of paganism becoming incorporated into Christianity. Now you're getting to the heart of what Babylon is really about. Mm -hmm. And, and the effects of it continue to this day in most of mainstream Christianity and God's call. If we go to the next chapter in revelation 18, we see an angel it says, after these things, I saw an an another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And verse two, he says, and he cried mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison of every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hateful bird. It is all saying the same thing again and again and again. Basically, this this woman, this church now has actually become almost like Satan's church. And it's just full of demons and demon worship and demon practicing. And it's pulling off to the public that it's mainstream Christianity, but it's actually demon worship. And so it's shocking for those who are caught up into this. And that's why sometimes it's better to leave it for people's inference, for you to go back and study it and, and look at, okay, the Bible says X, but these people do Y. 
And the Bible says do A, but they do C. And the Bible says don't do this, but they do that very thing. Hmm. If you add it up, you eventually realize, okay, these are the hallmarks of, of, a, of Christianity that's been corrupted by Satan. And God wants us to come out of that and return to the former ways, the ways that to the faith of Abraham, the faith of Moses, the faith of, of Jesus and of Peter and John and these disciples. Like, it's the same faith throughout, and that's what we're called to live. Definitely. Yeah, and what's interesting too is, you know, when you read that passage in Revelation 17, it's actually, I mean, there's, if you look back in the Old Testament, like in the book of Isaiah, um, chapter 21, it's actually quoting that where it says Babylon has fallen, has fallen. And, and it's, I think it's more of an allusion to basically when, you know, this is Israel's first captivity. Mm -hmm. And so it's God's people in the midst of, of you know, heathen land and God is calling it saying, Hey, finally, after this, you know, period of time, you know, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, come out of it. Like they're, the idols are destroyed. Like you, you know, now the truth, you're now free, come out of it. And that's exactly what God says is come out of her, my people. And so it's, a, you know, just kind of the same similar thing of, you know, when you're in a mystery, you don't know what's going on, but God, you know, he wants to make things clear and, and true and straightforward so that, you know, you know, the right path. Thank you.